the disappearance of man. Ruminations, testimonies to the ongoing disappearance of the human being. We begin with a couple of anecdotes. The first, the young lady runs over two people, kills them. She was driving a bit inebriated by alcohol and marijuana. A university student runs over these people, not worried, giggles, dances, laughs, utterly alienated from what is going on around her. The fruit of an upbringing. This is what is coming. We see this all over the place. Young people alienated from what is happening around them. They're being raised by computers to imitate computers. When you're raised by your father, you see your father as a model, you imitate your father. When you're raised by a computer, you imitate the computer, you follow the ways of the computer. Second anecdote. Recently, tests have been performed with computers trying to retrace language to thought. So what happens there? They, through a complex uh, process of testing, they see how the brain waves function in correlation with certain linguistic patterns. So that the computer, the so-called AI or artificial intelligence, will be able to scan brave, wing, brave waves and deduce from these wave these waves the words that we're supposed to be thinking. For indeed, we think in words, through words. And the experiments that were conducted were reasonably successful. Nothing conclusive, but uh, enough to astonish even the uh, technicians that were conducting the experiment. All right, now where does this lead us? Well, um, the experiment aims at non-invasive, of course, non-invasive invasion of, of uh, your mind. So we will have scanners of cerebral frequencies, waves, or whatnot, and the scanners should be able to translate those waves into, well, the, the words, the phrases, or at least the linguistic patterns that we are thinking in. So we won't need to speak in the future. We might not even need to, of course, go vote. The central machine, that agency that um, that, that uh, branches out into these scanners will be able to decipher everything you're thinking. Maybe it will fail. Maybe it will not attain any um, conclusive precision 
but it doesn't matter. The idea is what counts here. So the idea is that this machine will help us say what we think uh, without our needing to say it. It would spare us the trouble of speaking. It might even spare us the trouble of thinking um, once we don't have to speak any longer, once we're in our little cubicles. What's the point? We can go back and disappear from this world, uh, fall into our dreams, uh, a bit as what happens in that old film Brazil, where the fellow is completely alienated from this um, dystopia he lives in and runs away in his dream. And, of course, we have government-sponsored uh, use of of drugs of all sorts, opioids, marijuana, all of these drugs, and the biggest drug of all, or the, the more general drug, is, is distractions in general. Uh, the mass media, the news, everything is a distraction. And so we're fading into this um, alienation from a world of alienation. So the outside world is a world of alienation. And we are escaping from that alien world um, into further alienation. So we're disappearing. In this respect, the human being is disappearing. But something is to be said about this, um, something uh, that a couple of authors can help us discern. Um, why is this world that we are being uh, raised in today uh, the way it is, so inimical to the human being, so much so that it uh, drives us to seek a, an escape that is mediated by the machine, of course. Well, um, we live in a world of compulsions. That is pretty clear. And uh, we'll see a passage from an author from the 1700s. And then uh, we'll consider a passage from another one uh, of the uh, 1800s. Here we go. Giambattista Vico, Principles of uh, Renewed Science, 1744. Men first sense what is necessary, then they attend to what is useful, afterwards they notice what is comfortable, further on they take delight and pleasure, thereafter they dissolve themselves in luxury, and finally they go mad in squandering their substances. Giambattista Vico here offers us a picture of a life of compulsion. Fallen man is a man fallen into a world of compulsions. He first attends to his bare necessities, and then, well, once he has uh, assured those uh, necessities, he wants to do something with them. So he finds them useful. So what is necessary now, he can transform. It's useful for him. Useful meaning that it has an end. What does he seek at first? Well, uh, basic comfort. Um, he wants to turn these necessities into something a little bit more comfortable. And the comfortable um, already points to, well, pleasure. Comfortable is still tied to Utility, pleasure, is um, more abstracted from utility. And so he seeks pleasure. Now, this seems to be an answer to his work, his, um, his life, and yet uh, pleasure seeks more pleasure. And uh, so 
uh, Vico says that people dissolve themselves in luxury. Now they have more pleasure, um, and then finally they, they uh, seek possessions that are to, so these necessities are brought into play to the point where they no longer feel the pleasure. Uh, they no longer give them pleasure. So they accumulate possessions that are supposed to be converted into pleasure, but they fail to, uh, people fail to do that. And so they accumulate these necessities, and that is luxury. So they lose a pleasure of life, and they accumulate possessions. And now, finally, these possessions become a tomb, a prison, a cage, something that is oppressive. And so there's a tendency, a compulsion to squander everything that they have and themselves with these possessions. So this is madness. This is where people go completely um, uh, suicidal. They shift into a mode of self-destruction. Now, the life of compulsion uh, here is portrayed as pointing directly to self-destruction. And um, modern life, um, the modern life being the life in a modern world, is a life that um, remains within this picture. The modern world is supposed to be a world in which Compulsion is made judicious use of. What is most peculiar of the modern world? Uh, technology. And what does technology do? It makes use of our compulsions by um, placing them in the service of the establishment of a new world. Well, what is this new world ultimately about? Supposedly, it is a world in which we are freed from compulsions. And yet we are defined in terms of compulsions. So what would this freedom from compulsion really entail? It would entail freedom from our own being, understood strictly in terms of compulsions. Uh, this would, in, in practical terms, suggest that um, we are to enter into a sphere of life in which our own compulsions, our humanity, are transcended. Now, that sphere of life is the technological life. Um, one might say not real life, but that is not uh, of, of any concern here. For real life is conceived in terms of compulsions, unbridled and unchecked. And here the question is one of domesticating um, the compulsions. And what do we have here, really? Um, once we establish all compulsions in a technological framework, technology has achieved its goal, which is to say that the logic of technology um, has reached its completion. Technology is now the world in which our compulsions are finally at home. So they're complete. The cycle of compulsion is complete. And that is where we finally can um, uh, all together uh, commit suicide. This is where we destroy each, uh, each other and ourselves, uh, in effect, all together. This is where uh, we all go mad and squander our substances. It is no longer a, a particular um, person who does this uh, it is a whole world that is committing 
suicide, which is to say that the fullness of compulsion is exposed as the, the compulsion of a whole world. And the fullness of the compulsion signals self-destruction. So the initial point of technology being one of redefining our ends, so it's supposed to distract us from our petty compulsions, whatever we wish for at any given moment, by integrating those compulsions in a flow of rules and regulations, uh, in fact, presupposes that outside of those rules and regulations, uh, there is nothing more than the absurd, right? Um, in practical terms. Now, we could, in the technological society, we are allowed to dream of a god who is outside and um, but that God is a, a choice of ours. We, we can take it or leave it. In practical terms, we are to behave as if outside of the rules and regulations there were nothing more than the absurd. So um, the rules and regulations of the technocratic society um, really stand as gods. Well, uh, these rules and regulations, in effect, uh, have an end, a constitutional end, which is precisely that of bringing uh, to the fore um, our compulsions collectively. So we're really not expected to commit suicide, let's say, um, in, in particular cases, but as a collectivity, yes, that's all right. In fact, that's the whole point. Um, and that's an inevitable conclusion of this closure to divine transcendence, um, a closure that is signaled by the rise of technology. So uh, divine transcendence is replaced by the realm of the absurd, and this suggests that technology itself is the mask of the absurd. It is a mask that allows us to live in the face of this threat of absurdity that comes from without it. So we are compelled to abide in technology. But here's the, the point is that... Um, once we all gather under this technological hat, there altogether we can uh, commit suicide. Now, our second author is Giacomo Leopardi. We'll consider a passage, or a couple of passages from the Zibaldone, which is a very large collection of ruminations that are interwoven to constitute. Uh, a universe, a cosmos of sorts, that is guided by providence. The providence, of course, of uh, manifest as as uh, Leopardi himself, who is guiding us out of a realm of compulsion and uh, regain um, awareness of a thread that ties us to an original blessing. Uh, so a a condition of a being that is free from compulsion. <clears throat> In a passage um, numbered 2,232, Leopardi uh, addresses the question of Christianity. Essentially, he says, Christianity teaches us that I am to love uh, my neighbor as myself and myself for the sake of, um, for the sake of God. So, uh, under no circumstance does Christianity oblige me to oblige his man to love anything above himself. So, any being above himself. What what does um, what does uh, Leopardi mean here? Well, he means that there is a trajectory from the other to man, and through man back to God. God is not understood here as standing above 
um, as being above men. He goes on uh, suggesting that things are not good or evil aside from men. So things in themselves are neither good nor, nor evil. One might say or object that in Genesis, God says, well, this is, this is good, this is good. Well, in Genesis 1, um, on the other hand, one could say that when God says that something is good, what he means is that it's in the good place. And so uh, we could say that, that things in themselves are neither good nor bad, um, but that they're good when they are in the right place, so in God's mind, for instance, yeah? And uh, derivatively, uh, they are good when uh, they are ordered uh, uh, by man, in a derivative sense. Now, this gradually brings us to a passage, uh, 2,240, in which, uh, in 39 and 40, in which Leopardi uh, highlights a modern loss of the poetic, uh, of metaphors. Things and words are no longer seen as signs of what is uh, on the other side of them, or what, what they, they um, come out of. Um, this loss of the poetic, uh, which characterizes the modern world, and that is tied to um, a kind of uh, opacity that we find in uh, ancient Greek with respect to Latin, uh, this uh, loss of the poetic is tied to a sense uh, that, that we have lost nature as a realm um, that, that can guide us. As a guidance, uh, nature does not provide a rule for our life. But if that is the case, then it won't provide a rule for our death either. In other words, it doesn't tell us how to live and it doesn't tell us how to die. There's nothing unnatural about our seeking to die. But we do need, we do seek uh, happiness. And we don't seek it um, by tying it to nature. So we could we could seek happiness uh, by alienating ourselves from nature, and indeed by um, abandoning all nature. In fact, life becomes um, a major problem for us. Life alienated from nature, what is that? It, it is essentially a technical uh, false life that now grows into something that is hardly bearable. So it becomes more interesting to us to put an end to that life than to sustain it. We seek happiness, in other words, in death rather than in life, a life that is alienated from nature. Right. And of course, nature is not going to tell us not to go that way, because it doesn't tell us how to live. Why should it tell us how to die? What's wrong with destruction? Part of nature. So um, this is this is crucial. So now here we see um, why the life of compulsion leads to self-destruction. 
and why um, we're moving in that direction today, collectively. We have entered into the world of technology, a technology that is supposed to manage all of our compulsions together. Right? Uh, technology postpones suicide as a consummation of compulsion. It postpones it uh, toward this moment where we can all together commit suicide. Why is it more interesting to commit suicide rather than to keep going? Well, because that's simply because life is, is hardly bearable. Uh, the world is a world of alienation. We escape from it all the time in the machine, through the shocking news, through the internet, through the various distractions that the machine gives us. So life is unbearable. It is devoid of interiority, devoid of poetry. We seek the machine to distract us from that. And finally, when we're all in it together, uh, the process of integration is complete. Distraction is, is something that um, we no longer seek. We have become indifferent to distraction. Why? Because the total integration has already been achieved. One might say that um, we still have wars, but that, that's you know, an, an objection to technocracy, but that's not important because even that wars have been integrated in the system of technocracy. So everything is mediated by the machine. Even objections to technocracy are mediated by the machine. So that, that's not um, significant here. Um, we're all working together to establish a great conflagration. 